that uh, we use in aid than anything I've ever heard. The story of one man's finest hour, his rise and his fall, the making of the legend of Mad Mitch. These chaps have uh, gunned down British soldiers. Three of my own were killed here. But was he a fearless hero who restored the pride of the British Army, or did he bring shame on the dying days of the Empire? If some chap now starts throwing grenades or using pistols, we shall kill him. For more than 100 years, Aden was Britain's only Arab colony. It was largely peaceful, mostly profitable, but it's always been highly strategic. In Victoria's day, it guarded the trade route that fed the empire. It then kept the oil flowing to the industrialized world. Aden was a staging post for Britain's military deployments. Britain was giving up its empire. By the 1960s, India, Malaya, Kenya and Suez had gone. In the Middle East, Aden was next. By 1962, there was growing unrest in Aden and the whole of Yemen. A growing will to be free of British rule, to be a proud Arab nation, no matter the cost. This is also the story of the Scottish soldiers who fought and died in Aden. 40 years on, we hear from the veterans what it was like to fight for Queen and country on the far side of the world. Aden was Britain's toehold in southern Arabia, the gateway to the Red Sea. What became known as the last battle of the British Empire would be fought right in the heart of Aden. But for years before, this fight had been raging far to the north of the colony. Thousands of Scottish troops fought in the north of the country, in the notorious desert mountainous regions of the Radfan. They were helicoptered in and sent off to patrol for weeks at a time. Their mission was to quell the fierce Arab tribes that controlled the vast borders of north and south Yemen. These warrior tribesmen were legendary fighters, determined to resist British rule. We pitted brigade-sized forces against mountain, um, mountain rebels who'd lived there all their lives. They were fleet-footed, they could deal with high altitudes. We were very likely equipped, and I look at what they're running around in Afghanistan, Iraq, you know, carrying what looks like the kitchen sink with them, whereas we just had a small pack with us, you know, spare pair of socks, spare shirt, a jersey, carry water and lots of ammunition, and that's how we operated. It was quite extraordinary. We were living in what we call grots, which is basically a walled sanger because you couldn't dig down with some form of shelter above, normally just a bit of hessian. And that's how we lived. The Radfan campaign was reminiscent of the old wars of the empire. Troops stationed in isolated outposts, skirmishing with an enemy born and bred to fight in the mountains. Sometimes it seemed almost civilized. The locals in the first two tours used to come and shoot at you, but normally not until half past four in the afternoon, until six o'clock. They had up, some up-to-date weapons because I was trying to have a bath on the top of a, uh, a, a, a tall building and there were one or two thumps and then someone shouted that I should stop bathing and get down. Uh, and I discovered that I was being fired at from a rocket launcher. We would reply using mortars, artillery, and often using Hawker hunters bringing in airstrikes against them. And on one occasion, I remember, they came under white flag to complain, and they felt that we were cheating and that wasn't playing the game. The fighting in the mountains to the north of Aden also served to stem the tide of a new breed of nationalist fighter slipping across the border. Their terror tactics would bring a new kind of war to the colony. We had a porous border with Yemen. The rebels could just go backwards and forwards at will. We tried to engage them in open conflict. We inflicted casualties, but they just went back across the border, regrouped and seeped back in again. By 1967, the insurgent fighters were exacting a high price from the British forces. 
itching to get into Aden and prove themselves were the Argyle and Sutherland Highlanders, one of the most famous and combat experienced battalions in the British Army. Their commanding officer was Lieutenant Colonel Colin Mitchell. He would prove to be one of the most controversial figures in Scottish military history. Brisk, uh, workmanlike, um, certainly charismatic. Um, and I made the mistake of querying something he said to me, and um, that was the last time I did that. He was small of stature, steely-eyed, spoke in a sort of rat-a-tat way. There was no pansy pottering about. He was a straightforward guy. Some people maybe but didn't like him very much, but they'd still follow him anywhere. Mitchell's Argyles were gathering in Plymouth. He knew they were heading into a brutal conflict and he expected to take casualties. And his soldiers would be fighting in one of the hottest places on earth. He was determined his men would be ready. Colonel Mitchell was one of these type of people, if he was going to take his men somewhere, he made sure that the, the guys were up to spate for the job they were going to do. I think we put the heating on in the gym, closed all the windows and, and did an awful lot of um, press-ups and, and things and we sweated away. The whole of the barracks was renamed as such so we could learn some of the streets. We knew we were covering Crater. So we got to know the names, familiarise ourselves with where we'd be going. Uh, so we wouldn't be totally new to it, spending all our time looking at a map to see what streets this, what streets that. When the Argyles arrived in Aden, it was midsummer in the Middle East. Temperatures were peaking at more than 105 degrees. So I arrived in Aden, it, it was very, very hot. And when I got out of the aircraft, wearing a pinstripe suit, carrying my trophy hat, um, it was like wading through a overheated room hung with great big hot steaming blankets. Oof, it was hot, it was uh, busy, and it was rather minging, if you want to put it in the jokes expression. It was crowded, I mean, uh, one and a half miles by half a mile, 80,000 people, very narrow streets, lots and lots of streets and cuttings between bazaars, uh, a lot of filth and rubbish in the streets. By June 1967, Mitchell and his advance guard had arrived in Aden. The British Army was now working hand in hand with the Arab National Police. The problem was that the police were riddled with nationalist sympathisers who backed the fight for independence and who were determined to see the end of British rule. Crater was rife with rumour and mistrust. Crater was a hot, fetid township within the bowl of a volcano, which is why it was called Crater. And it was very much an urban, the, the urban part of Aden. It was the hotbed where all the, the rebels vied for supremacy, the NLF and Flossie, who were the two rivals. And it was, I say, within a crater, and it was um, closely watched by our security services. And it was the very place, if something was going to erupt, it would happen in crater. To Colin Mitchell, rebellion was inevitable. Colin was nervous of something happening, not nervous for himself, but nervous, aware that there was something wrong. But even Mitchell would be shocked at what was to come. The British Army was to suffer one of the biggest losses of life in one day since the Second World War. Deep in the heart of Crater, the pressure was reaching boiling point. The Arab National Police finally turned on their British rulers. On the morning of the 20th of June, 1967, the Arab National Police Force was in mutiny. They'd taken up arms and barricaded themselves into their barracks. Hearing that trouble was brewing, the British dispatched a patrol to investigate. It came down this main road into Crater. The Arab National Police had used buses to blockade the road. Still uncertain of what lay ahead, the British patrol pressed forward. But the patrol had driven into a well-laid ambush. They were outgunned and pinned down. The Arab Nationalists opened up from all sides. In a matter of minutes, British soldiers lay dead and dying in the streets. Three of them were Argyles.
these war paintings from Aden depict the massacre in vivid detail. They massacred these guys, literally massacred them. An open dual carriageway surrounded on all sides from high buildings, armed men with automatic weapons. I only hope they all died quickly. After the mutiny, the British were ordered to completely withdraw from Crater. They set up observation posts on the high ground. It was from up here that Mitch and his soldiers had to look back down into the town where the bodies of their friends and comrades were dragged through the streets. For Mitchell, this was a complete humiliation. The bodies were not allowed to be collected and I think it was a disgraceful decision. I think, still think it's a disgraceful decision. They were massacred in a particularly brutal manner and this had just happened. The Arab terrorist had trumpeted this deed and within the Arab world it was a case of Britain has been, um, you know, defeated. For the people of Yemen fighting for independence, the so-called mutiny was to be celebrated. For the insurgents of the National Liberation Front, their victory brought more people to their cause. They now believed the British could be beaten and driven out of their country. It's not important who was killed from this side or that side, because killing at those days was happening in both sides. Uh, but this event was a turnover uh, in the struggle uh, at those days. The liberation of Crater was a great achievement. For two weeks in the summer of 67, the city of Crater in the heart of the British colony of Aden was ruled by the Arabs. Back in Whitehall, politicians feared that going back into Crater would inflame the situation and the Arab revolt would spread. To many British soldiers, it looked like peace at any price. People were sort of uh, anxious to get back at something, somebody, especially a guy or having lost their men or about to go out and take somebody's head off. But you weren't allowed to do it. No, you couldn't do these things. We were forbidden to do anything about it. Um, and that was really the cause of all the, the root cause of all the trouble we had with JHQ. We were expecting, uh, because British forces were uh, much stronger than ours. Yeah, what was surprising that they took more than 10 days uh, to retake. Uh, I think this is because of the shock. Back in Whitehall, I think Middle East Command were very sensitive that the whole place might blow up. It was easier to have a soldier killed, play the flowers of the forest, have a funeral with a Union Jack on it and all the rest of it. That was less embarrassing than um, to um, do the job properly. Tensions between Mitchell and Middle East Command were stretched to breaking point. Mitch was champing at the bit to retake Crater. Middle East Command favoured negotiations. They feared a bloodbath and a widespread mutiny across southern Yemen. Of course, his mission was a military one in Crater. At all times, he was trying to be constrained by uh, Middle East Command, who, of course, had to look to their political masters. His immediate commanders had the brief from the uh, from British government that they wanted Crater just handed over eventually. They didn't want to hang on to it, whereas Mitchell wanted to hang on to it and control it. Middle East Command estimated there could be as many as 400 nationalist fighters now defending Crater. Senior officers believed that retaking Crater would mean hundreds of casualties. It was simply too high a price to pay. But Mitchell kept pushing and pushing. Eventually, his orders were approved. Exactly how he carried out those orders remains contentious to this day. Mitchell and his men were desperate to get back in, to retake Crater, for the sake of their honor and for the sake of their dead. Finally, on the night of July the 3rd, 1967, he gathered his battalion here on the road to Crater. This is where the legend of Mard Mitch was born. The regimental charge was, was sounded at seven o'clock that evening and we went in tactically um, very efficiently um, with a lot of surprise. The pipes had started and sorry, you know, when you got the pipes going, you know, to help with anything else. 
the tingle goes up the spine. <laughs> that just puts the hackles in your hair in the back of your head. It just stands up there and it makes you proud. The sheer shock of seeing all these Highlanders coming in, obviously people thinking, well, perhaps they're coming for revenge. I expect them to take casualties. We certainly expected to take casualties. We expect a lot of fire, we expect a lot of uh, action. But strange enough, uh, we never actually come up against anything really solid that night. Mad Mitch swept through Crater. The Argyles met little resistance as they rolled through the city. One Arab was killed that night. There were no British casualties. It was a perfect textbook of the operation. They found out, they took control of the commercial centre, they put up the sign Stirling Castle, which was, of course, the old regimental um, headquarters. The press loved this, and, of course, the, the, the legend of Mad Mitch came into being, and he was seen driving around in the Land Rover around Crater. And I think the British public certainly lapped this up. And so the legend of Mad Mitch grew, the fearless officer who led from the front. But how far had Mitch actually gone? Had he disobeyed orders? He'd interpreted um, what he was told with a slightly Nelsonian. Um, he didn't see the signals quite as clearly as he might have done. Even 20 years after Aidan, Colonel Mitchell himself still wouldn't answer the question directly. Did you disobey orders? Yes, I mean, there's no doubt about it that, that, that uh, in in securing the, in, in reoccupying Crater in the way that I wanted to do it, it required as much subterfuge and smoke and, and, and haze to be directed towards the people behind me as it did towards the people in front. As dawn broke on the morning of July the 4th, the pipes played over Crater. The message was clear, the British were back. This time, Mad Mitch was in charge, the battle-hardened soldier who had lost three men. Now he had to keep the peace. His form of martial law would prove even more controversial. It became known as Argyle Law. We're going to be extremely firm and uh, extremely mean. Uh, these chaps have uh, gunned down British soldiers. Three of my own were killed here. And, uh, I have no compunction in saying that if some chap from now starts throwing grenades or using pistols, we shall kill him, quite rightly. Crater was run on my guy law, and that's a perfectly sensible remark, it was. But there wasn't any other law. As our guile law was enforced, there were allegations of mistreatment and abuse. We did what we were told to do. We stuck by the letter of the law. Uh, shoot me, I shoot you. Uh, simple as that. Um, if other companies were a bit more robust, then fine. I, would, I couldn't comment. We were very firm. I stood no nonsense, but I never mistreated anybody. You know, and I would not allow any of my soldiers to mistreat anybody. The local population feared the British would take revenge for the mutiny and the killing of their soldiers. They were pretty rough. They tried to show as much restraint as possible, and I believe that was uh, the instructions which must have been given by the British higher authorities. But uh, in general, during that period, you will find most of the people complaining. I think they were very frightened of us, of case, because they knew that it was our soldiers that had been killed and they were probably apprehensive as to what we might do. What sort of speed are you driving at? Yes, you go more slowly. Go slowly, sorry, sorry, sir. Order, oh, slowly. Order, sir. Do you understand? Order, sir. There's no speeding in Crater. Order, sir. Order. Order. The eyes of the world's media were on Crater, but that didn't ease Mitch's iron grip on the city. Forty years on, the BBC's Brian Barron returned to the streets of Crater. It was here that he met Mitch just after the Arabs had attacked an Argyle patrol. I got down here just after the Argyles had killed four of the Arabs. They were bodies were stacked on the sidewalk here, like carcasses, frankly, in a butcher's shop. And Colonel Mitchell came up to me and he said he was feeling very pleased with himself. And he said, it was like shooting grouse, a brace here, a brace there. 
That was the authentic Colonel Mitchell. But the soldiers on patrol believed Argyle law worked and saved lives. I'm not saying that occasionally someone may have been quick on the trigger, but that's the situation, fast-moving situation you're in. If a chap appears and you think he's got a grenade in his hand and is about to throw it at you, and you're invited to challenge him three times, by the time you've got the first one out, the grenade is flying through the air at you. There may have been allegations, but as far as I'm concerned, um, what we did uh, was an extremely good job, extremely professional job. And I'm quite certain that there are many Aideners alive today who wouldn't have been uh, if we hadn't operated in the way we did. There were many occasions when one would have liked to have opened fire, but one jolly well couldn't. I often think that perhaps it's more difficult in certain circumstances to obey the rules, the orders, uh, than uh, to disobey them. Even with Argyle law, the British were suffering casualties and were under constant fear of attack. Mad Mitch believed the only way to operate was to take the fight to the enemy, be active, be seen, to keep patrolling the streets of Crater. It's hard to think of a worse place on earth to patrol against a dedicated enemy than Crater. This city is a warren of narrow, cramped streets where temperatures would soar to well over 105 degrees. And the enemy, they knew every twist and turn of these streets. They could be waiting around the next corner or lurking at the back of a crowd. And their weapon of choice, the hand grenade. However alert the British soldiers were, casualties were inevitable throughout the five years of the Aden conflict. Hand grenades were always utmost in the minds of soldiers on patrol. Something close on 108 grenades were thrown at us. You get quite agile when uh, that is happening. You soon learn when to duck and when not to. Most grenades have a fuse of about four seconds. By the time you see the grenade, you probably realize that one and a half to two seconds is already gone. Your first reaction actually is to die flat on your back or front as soon as you can. It's usually quite a sharp crack, but then you've got to get to find the chap who threw it because you don't want him to do that too often. On one occasion, I remember one being thrown at one of my patrols, which bounced off the pavement into the local uh, into the uh, local restaurant and uh, unfortunately took out a couple of their own people, uh, which was pretty daft. A BBC camera crew caught the aftermath of one grenade attack on film. A grenade's gone off. It looks as though uh, one of them's bought it. One grenade in a crowded market, four soldiers caught in the blast. Somebody had been watching for a soft target and lobbed a grenade over. It was rolled, in fact, so it was very difficult to see where the grenade landed, and it landed close to Rifle McLaren. 21-year-old Charles McLaren from Rutherglen died at the scene. The ambulance has arrived. Figures three casualties have been removed. One of them looks bad. And he was killed there, doing his job, doing it quietly, doing it efficiently. A good man, buried in Little Aden. We remember him. With casualties mounting, Britain's time in Aden was coming to an end. Mitch had flown the flag once more in the heart of Aden, but was the last battle of the British Empire ever worth fighting? A few months after retaking the city, the British were to withdraw from Aden. It was the end of 128 years of British rule in the colony. Mitchell had clashed with senior officers once too often. He may have won a stunning victory in Aden, 
but he would never recover from the damage it had done to his career. The making of the legend of Mad Mitch had been his undoing. So after the British withdrawal, Mitchell was snubbed. A mere mention in dispatches for a man who'd commanded a battalion in action, something that would normally have merited a medal at least. And it was made clear to him that there was no room for Mad Mitch in the British Army. He'd blown his chances of promotion. It was a complete insult. But OK, it, that's the way they wanted to play it, that's the way they did. Um, and our guards were unpopular in a, in a large section of the army. I suspect he could probably irritate um, a lot of senior officers. You don't get a lieutenant colonel commanding his battalion uh, behaving the way Colin does without irritating some people. Mitchell was finished. His life in the army with his beloved Argyles was over. Had it all been worth the sacrifice? If it wasn't him, and some, perhaps somebody else, perhaps with different style of tactics of doing things, the British forces casualties in Aden and Crete especially would have been a lot higher. He took their girls in there and fixed uh, the problem out, which that's maybe why they decided to call him Mad Mitch, you know. But he wasn't mad, I can guarantee you that. He was the least mad person I think I've ever met. Forty years after the last shots were fired in Aden, British soldiers are still fighting in the Middle East. As you wander amongst the graves, it's difficult not to be struck by the parallels between the conflict in which Mitchell and thousands of other servicemen fought here and the wars being fought today. The street fighting, the insurgency problems um, in, in places like Basra are virtually identical. The technology has changed, but issues like um, infiltration of the local police forces, as happened in Aden, uh, is happening very much in, in, in Iraq. Once somebody de declares what date they're going to leave a situation, it is fraught with danger for the people who are there. That happened in Aden. Um, that certainly is, seems to be happening in Iraq. And um, I don't think politicians ever really learned this lesson. I don't think they read their history books. Like the fighting in Iraq and Afghanistan, the conflict in Aden will always be shrouded in controversy. But for Colonel Colin Mitchell, there was never any doubt. A great many Arabs are alive today because we use these methods, and a great many Argyles are alive today because we use them. And this, to me, is the complete exoneration of, of, uh, of anything, if we needed exonerating, which we don't, never have, never have.